Hello, everybody. Let's get started. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, good. Awesome. I see a lot of names that are new and I see a lot of names that are familiar. So this will be an exciting class. Good to see some of you again. And always good to see new faces too. Um, so this is going to be a uh, a class about uh, doing game development with uh, Pico 8. And I know some of you have already done some of, uh, done this class before. And so some of this, uh, some of what we'll cover isn't super new to you, but it's always good to go over it again, just to get a refresher. All right, so what we're gonna do is, um, first thing we're gonna start off is, we're gonna see, this is what you start with when you open up Pico 8. And um, for some of you, uh, we covered this yesterday, um, but if you open this up and this takes up your entire screen, you can hit Alt Enter. So that's the hold down the Alt key and then hit the Enter key. It's like the key, you know, to go to a new line. Um, so you hold down Alt and hit Enter. Um, on some keyboards, it's called Return. Um, and that will take it out of full screen. And if you hit it again, it will go back into full screen. So if you're dealing with Pico 8 and it's taking the entire screen, hit Alt Enter and it'll come out of full screen. Um, all right, so then what you start off here is you start off here at this screen and this is called the console and it's where you can type in commands. Um, we're not gonna spend a lot of time in this screen, um, but you should just know what it is. It's basically just allows you to type in things like you can save your game or load it, um, things like that. So for example, if I wanna save my game, I can say, uh, save my game and hit enter. And I already have one, so it'll say, oh, do you wanna overwrite it? And I'm gonna say no, but um, if you have a game you wanna call it, or we could so save it, um, uh, cool game. Oh, I already have one called that too. All right, well, let's save it as um, new game. There we go. Okay, so new game wasn't taken. Um, so. If I type save new game, it saves it. And then, then from this point forward, if I hit control S or command S on a Mac, if I hit uh, control S or command S, you'll see this thing pop up and it'll say saved. So anytime you're working, after you've done this command where you type save and then whatever the name of your game is, if after you've done that, if you hit control S or command S, it will save what you're working on. And that's important because uh, we don't want you to lose anything uh, when we start making a game. So today what we're gonna cover is we're gonna cover how to use Pico 8 just in general. We're gonna cover some coding concepts and then tomorrow. Um, so today we're gonna cover how to use Pico 8, some basic coding concepts. And then tomorrow we're gonna um, start actually writing the, the start of our game and then we'll get it finished up the next day. Um, so if you just joined, um, all we've done so far is we've loaded up Pico 8. Um, when you first start it, it looks like this. Um, and then you end up in this screen where you can save things or load things. So if I, if I want to save my game, like we did last time, I would type save new game and I would enter, but because I already saved it, if I want to load it, I would type load new game and then hit enter and it would load it. Um, but obviously for a lot of you, you just started, so you don't have anything to load. So we're going to start it off completely brand new here. Um, if you type reboot, it, it restarts Pico 8. So that's another thing to know. Um, so what I want you to do is hit the escape key, which is in the top left corner of your keyboard. You hit escape and you'll end up in this screen. And this screen is where we write all the code for Pico 8. And um, we're gonna spend a lot of time in here today because we're gonna learn some coding concepts, but I wanna show you all the parts of Pico 8. So down here, it tells you what line you are on. And um, up here, you have different tabs. You can make different tabs of code. Um, if, if there's nothing in them, they just go away. So um, you can see they just went away. Uh, up here, this is where we switch what we're doing in Pico 8. So the parentheses is where we're writing code. And the little monster face, this, if you click on that, that goes to the sprite editor. And the sprite editor is where we make the art for our games. Now, a sprite is just the name for a piece of art in a game. 
And in Pico 8, you start off with this one sprite here and just leave that one alone. We're not going to edit this one because this is we, this has another use. So we're going to start off. That's why it actually starts you off here at sprite number one. Each of these has a number. You can see the number changes over here as I move around. Um, and then we have a lot of space for sprites. There are eight pixels, eight dots by eight dots. And you, you can choose from these colors to draw from. Um, so a classic thing that I like to draw that's super easy is like a big smiley face because I'm really good at drawing it and I can draw it really fast. Um, so we, you know, let's put a smiley face here. Any pixels that are black are see-through. So if you don't have anything there, you'll be able to see through that part of the, of the sprite. Um, we'll add some eyes and a mouth and we'll add some shading so that it looks a little cooler than just, and we'll add some shininess there. So there we go, we have a sprite. So this is sprite number one and you can use any of these colors. If you wanna erase something, you can just um, use the color black and that erases it. Um, if you ever mess up, control Z or command Z on a Mac will undo. And if you keep hitting it, it keeps undoing. So control Z or command Z on a Mac will undo something if you accidentally make a mistake. Like let's say I draw, oh, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Control Z will undo that. And so we're gonna make use of lots of these sprites. Um, you have a pencil tool, you have a paint bucket. So if we go to like this one and I use the paint bucket and I click on orange and click in there, it fills it in with orange. Um, I'm gonna hit control Z. Or let's say I um, let's say I go to this one and I draw, I'm gonna go to my pencil tool. Um, if you, uh, Elijah has a question, how do you exit Splore? If you uh, got into Splore somehow, then just hit escape and um, you can choose exit Splore. Um, I'll explain what Splore is to the rest of you later. So in this sprite, uh, let's say I have this and I can go to my paint bucket and I can click blue and then fill it and it only fills in inside there. It's a pretty basic, um, you know, editing thing. It's not super complex and you have shapes over here. You can, you can draw shapes and you can change it. You know, we'll draw a box or a line, you know, lots of different things. Um, I'm going to use my paint bucket here and undo all this stuff. Okay. So, We've got a sprite here on number one. We've got these colors. Um, we have lots of spaces to put different sprites. And now, um, let's say I have a few sprites like a big green sprite and a big blue sprite um, and maybe a gray sprite. Okay, so I've got, these are just, you know, random blocks of color I've made. So now in the map editor, the map editor is used to draw maps using the sprites that you made. So for instance, if we wanted to, you know, draw a big thing of grass here, we could just, so it uses, doesn't draw individual pixels, like individual dots. This uses the entire sprite as like a painting, as a paintbrush. And so you can draw a whole map here and, um, and then, you know, let's say we want some water, we can draw, draw some water over here and um, the the map editor has lots of tools to help you out like for instance it's got a little hand tool so you can drag your map around um, each screen of pico 8 is 16 map tiles wide so if we go to the pencil tool um, it's you'll see this is 16 tiles wide you'll see down here it tells you the coordinates Coordinates are just how far over and how far down. So like if we go here, that's four, two. So it starts at zero, one, two, three, four, and then two is zero, one, two. So you can always see like what the X and Y of each map tile is. Um, Shanna, so uh, all we've done so far is we're just going over uh, Pico 8. We're just covering the different parts of Pico 8 and what each part of it does. Um, so some of that might be familiar to you because you've done this class before, but um, it was just a refresher. 
Um, so you can also, if you have a mouse with a middle button, like if it looks like, oops, sorry, I mean to make a big noise. If you've got a middle mouse button like this, you can hold that down and that lets you drag around as well. But you can also just, you know, uh, use the hand tool and drag your map around. Um, you can also hold down the space bar. And if you hold down the space bar, you'll notice when I hold it down, it makes this grid and turns my mouse into a hand. So even if I'm on this pencil tool to, you know, to draw things and I'm like, you know, drawing stuff like this, I can hold down the space bar and use the pencil tool and drag around. And you can see because a map screen is 16 tiles across, and this is not 16 tiles down. So we can hold down the space bar and drag upward. And then you can see here's the rest. And you can do things like you can use the paint bucket tool. So we can use the paint bucket tool and fill this entire area with green or fill it with blue or gray. Um, and if you hold down the space key, it'll just, you know, let you drag around. Um, so that's a, it's a pretty easy tool. There's nothing too fancy about it. it. Just lets you draw a map. So that was the code editor with the parentheses, the sprite editor with the little monster head, the map editor with this little grid. And then we have the sound editor. And that is this little play button here. And this allows you to make sounds for your game. And there's different instruments that make different sounds. And you can choose from here. And this is which number sound you're working on. And if you want to go to the next sound, you just click this or click back. And, um, and then you can literally just draw your sound on the screen. And so if I do one here and then draw this straight across, um, this changes the speed that your sound is. If you click on it, it makes it slower. If you right click, it makes it faster. You can also click and drag back and forth if you want to change that number too. So the bigger the number, the slower it is. So if I put it like five, right, that will, that will play this sound slower than if I put it, say, at like one or two. And this down here lets you change the volume of each part of your sound. Now, if I hit space bar, it will play this sound. And it sounds kind of like a coin sound, but we want it to kind of like fade off. So you can change the volume over here. You can say, well, the volume should start here, but as it plays, it should get quieter. So now you can hear it kind of gets a little bit quieter at the end. Now these other instruments sound different. So if I use those instead, so now, or if I use this one, you can hear it sounds different. This one sounds like, 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 you know, static. And here it sounds like static. Yep. And if you want to erase a part of a sound, you can just go down here and set the volume to zero. You can drag around too. So you can, you know, if you want to set it to zero, just drag across the bottom there. So this is the sound editor. And, you know, you can see uh, we can speed this sound up. And if I hit space very fast, I can make it slow. So there's lots of things you can do with making lots of different sounds. I'm going to go to the next sound here, like here. And then I'm going to go to this sound, the pink one. And then I'm going to slow this down to like, or speed it up, I mean, to like four. And then I'm going to drag this all the way down like that. And then I'm going to make the volume also kind of go all the way down like that. And then when we hit play, and we can speed it up even more. And you can hear that's like a, you know, like a crash sound, like if something bangs in or explodes. You know, so there's, you can get really creative with making sounds. Um, there's lots of things you can do. Again, space bar lets you play sounds. Okay, so that's the sound editor. You can use these sounds to make music too. So for example, um, let's, if I make another sound and I go to say this sound here and I go uh, here, we're going to, we're going to change these sounds here. Oops. 
Oops. I'm just I I'm not a musician. I'm just making random stuff here. So you can you can make it however you want. I'm going to speed it up a little bit to like 12. <laughs> Maybe add a little bit more. There we go. So you can see, like, that's not like super great music. It's just something. But I'm going to make another sound. And I'm going to set it also to 12. But I'm going to use this one. And I'm going to do this. Like, do, 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 and then. Oops, I meant to space these out by like twos here. So we're just we're just having fun with the sound editor here. This is this is this is a lot of fun to play with. So I'm just so now All right, so now we have these two sounds. We have this one and then this one. Right? And then what we can do is we can go to the music editor and we can say, okay, so in this column, I want to play, and you can right click or you can click and drag. If you want to go down or up, you can click or right click and that picks different sounds. So remember in this sound, we were, this is sound three and this is sound two, right? So if we go to the music editor and we say, okay, so play sound two. Now we hit space. Okay, good. And then, so that's fine. That's, you know, sound two. But then we go to the next thing and we say, okay, now after that, now I want you to play sound two and I want you to play sound three. So now it'll play this and then it'll play this. So we can hit space and hit watch. You can see, so like we have sort of the beginnings of music. It's um, oh, hit space bar to play. Um, so we can go back to zero and then. I mean, so this isn't like, you know, super good music, but I like it. It's pretty good. And you can kind of see how the music works with the sounds. But you can also use the sounds for just doing like, you know, like things like this, like the coin sound, or you can just do like, uh, like a little power up sound, you know, like, or maybe make it faster and be like, or. So there's lots of things you can do. You can have, you can have a lot of fun doing these sounds. But now I want to get into uh, learning some of the coding concepts. So what we've covered so far is we have the music editor, we have the sound editor, we have the map editor, we have the sprite editor, and we have the code editor. So we have lots of different ways we can add parts to our game. And the code editor is really where all of this comes together. And the way we're gonna go over this, we're gonna go over two really basic fundamental concepts about coding. And, um, and again, I know some of you have covered this before. It is good to just go over it again, just get a new uh, fresh view on it. So when you're coding, you're writing out instructions line by line for the computer. So if we, for instance, if we say uh, clear the screen, CLS, and then use parentheses, parentheses, and we'll learn what all of these mean in a minute. But if you type CLS, parentheses, parentheses, and then hit enter, and then type print, parentheses, quote, hello, end quote, end parentheses. So this tells two instructions to the computer. It says first clear the screen and then it tells the computer to print the word hello. And we use quotes to tell it when we have text we want to print. Even if we want to um, say like a number, hello two, then 
the two is still treated like text because it's inside these quotes as opposed to two like a number two where you could add to it this is considered just text when we have quotes around it so these are just instructions to the computer if we want to run it you can just hit control r or command r on a mac so if you hit control r you can see it clears the screen and then it printed hello and then it ended and that was it and that's not a very fun program but it works and if you hit escape it will go back into the code editor so if we wanted to uh print a number print five notice there's no quotes around this so it's treating it like a number not as text but it still prints out like text so we hit Control r or command r and you see hello two and then five now because this is a number we can do things we can say like five plus seven and now what happens is it does this math first and then it prints out what the answer is so if we run it we'll see it does 12 because it actually does the math and then it prints out what the result is <clears throat> and that's pretty useful because there's a lot of things we can do here um we can also do other things too like we can uh, so here you can see we're printing text and here we're printing numbers and we're even having the numbers do some math but then we can also do things like print you know five is less than nine well that's not a number that's just a true or false is five less than nine so if we if we run this control r or command r on a mac you'll see it prints true because and then I hit escape again to go back into the code because five is less than nine. Now, what if we change this to greater than five greater than nine? Well, that's not true. So when we run it, you'll see it prints false because that's five is not greater than nine. And this is useful to, to be able to think with true and false is very useful when you're writing programs because sometimes you need to make decisions about what should happen in the program. Like, should I display the game over screen? Well, only display the game over screen if game over is true, you know, or like the number of hearts they have is less than zero. Well, then print the game over screen. Um, <clears throat> so it's good to know, good to have ways to see if things are true or false. So these are instructions to the computer, <clears throat> but sometimes you need to have um, instructions you want to use over and over again. So for example, let's say um, <clears throat> I'm going to get rid of these here. I'm going to leave the CLS there, but I'm going to get rid of this. This is an instruction that we can easily tell the computer in one line. We can just say, um, uh, Milo, yes, we are going to be doing a new game tomorrow. Don't worry, but I'll tell you about it tomorrow. Um, so this is just a single instruction and we can run it as many times as we want it. It won't do anything extra because, you know, we already cleared the screen, but we could run it, you know, multiple times. But let's say we have something where we want to draw something on the screen. Like, let's say we want to draw um, a, well, let's, let's draw a, uh, let's draw a target. So we'll do circ fill. Circ fill is a, it's called, um, these are called functions, these instructions that you can give. Um, and we put parentheses, circ fill stands for a filled circle. And we have to tell it where on the screen, like how far over. And there's, this screen is 128 dots across. Those are called pixels, 128 pixels. So the middle of the screen would be like 64. So if we say 64, that means 64 dots over. And then maybe like, 30 dots down. So it'll be like this far over and like this far down. Then we have to tell it how wide, like from the center to the edge, how big should it be? And so we'll say like, you know, maybe 10 pixels. So it'll be 10 pixels from the middle out to the edge. And then we have to say what color. Now to pick a color, you can go over here to the sprite editor and all of these colors have a number down at the bottom corner when you move your mouse over it. So if we wanted to use, you know, red, for example, we'd use color eight. You can see it down here. So if we wanted to use green, we'd use color 11. So for right now, let's use color uh, seven. So I'm gonna say color seven and then end parentheses. Now what this does is these parentheses 
say, okay, here's all the information we want to tell this instruction what to do. Again, these instructions are called functions. Um, so we tell this function, here's all the information you need. Here's how far over, here's how far down, here's how, how big, and here's what color. And now if we run it, control R, you can see it did exactly what we told it to do. We said, go 64 pixels over, 30 pixels down, make a circle that's 10 pixels big, and fill it with white. Pretty simple. Now if we do that again, we'll say same spot, 64 pixels over, 30 pixels down, but this time we're gonna use color eight, which is the color, or I mean, sorry, we're gonna make it a little smaller. So we'll make it seven pixels wide, and we're gonna use the color eight. So now it'll be a little bit of a smaller circle, but it's gonna be red. I'm gonna give everybody a sec to type that in. And then we run it. And you can see, first it drew a white circle, then it drew a red circle inside of it. Okay, so you can see it's just following the instructions one at a time. And now we're gonna put one last circle in the middle of that. Same thing, 64 over 30 down. And this time, instead of seven pixels wide, we're gonna make it like four pixels wide. And then we're gonna make it color white again. And we're gonna hit Control R. And you can see now it draws kind of like a target. So this is useful because now we have a whole set of instructions here that will draw a target. But the problem is we wanna draw this target a number of times in a bunch of places. So we could write circle fill three times, like a bunch of times. So let's say we wanted three targets, we would have to draw nine circles and that'd be a lot of code. But sometimes you wanna just say, I wanna just do this set of instructions again and again and again. So what we do is we go up to the top here and we type function draw target. Now see how that's kind of hard to read? It's like draw target. So what we do is we go into the middle and we use an underscore. Now underscore is shift dash. And that makes it so that the computer still sees it as one word, but we see it as two words. We can kind of pretend there's a space there. And so shift dash will do that underscore. And then we have to put parenthesis, parenthesis. And then we can space these in like this. And then at the end, we have to type end. So what this does is what we did is we made our own function right here. This is a function called circfill. We made a function called draw target. It doesn't take any information, but we still have to put these parentheses. And in this function, what it does is it draws a circle, then draws another circle, then draws another circle. Now, if we run this, nothing will happen. And I'll explain why. So if I run it, watch, no target. Why not? We have all the instructions to draw a target, but there is no target. That's because we just wrote out how draw target should work. We said, this is a function called draw target. But we didn't say to actually do it. We just said, this is how it should work if you do do it. So the way we run it is we just by itself without saying the word function, we just say draw target, parenthesis, parenthesis. This tells it actually to go do this set of instructions. And if we run it, we see it. now it draws the target and escape. So this lets us write our own function. We can say, here's a set of instructions that I want you to run, and I want you to call that batch of instructions draw target. Now, this is not a very useful function because if we try to draw it again, and we say, okay, now draw another target, well, it's gonna draw it in the same spot. So we have two targets drawn in the same spot. That's not useful to us because we wanna draw this target all over the screen. So what we can do is we can say in our draw target, we can say, you know what, I want you to be able to except an X and a Y number. Remember X is how far over, Y is how far down. So I wanna tell draw target, I want you to be able to take two numbers, okay? When, when someone runs draw target, I want them to be able to tell us two different numbers and those numbers, we're gonna use those. And we're gonna say, instead of drawing at 64 over and 30 down every time, use that number that they gave us, X for how far over, 
and use the number they gave us for how far down. Okay. Now it's going to use whatever number is given to draw target as where to draw the circle. And so now what we need to do is in draw targets parentheses, we need to give it a number. So if we say 64 over and 30 down, now 64 will get sent to X and get used as X when we draw the circles and 30 will get sent to Y and um, then get used here. Adira, use Control R or Command R if you're on a Mac. If you're on a Mac, it's Command R. If you're on a PC, it's Control R. And then you hit Escape when you're when you're done. It will come back to the code. So now we have a function called Draw Target that takes two numbers, x and y, and then we use those x and y when we draw our circle. These these labeled numbers are called variables because they can vary, they might change. Vary means, you know, it can be different. So in this case, the variable is called X and the variable is called Y. And this time when we run draw target, we're sending 64 and 30, but the next time we draw target, we could say maybe 140. So now the next time it goes to run draw target, it will use 100 for X and 40 for Y. So let's run that and see what happens. We'll hit control R. Okay, so look at that. Now we drew a target at 64 over and 30 down and 100 over and 40 down. So we now have a much more useful uh, function because we can tell it to draw this target wherever we want on the screen. If we try tell it again, we could say, all right, draw 30 over and 100 down. And now we have three targets. So that's really useful for when we're coding because we don't have to write circ fill like a bunch of times. We only have to write it one time and then tell it where do we want these instructions to happen. And then here we can just, it's just one line, we can just say, oh yeah, do that batch of instructions and here's the information you need in order to do those instructions. This is a really important part of coding is being able to write a set of instructions and then elsewhere in your code say, okay, go run that set of instructions. And this is really useful. These are called functions and these labeled names are called variables. And so now I want to, let's go over something else now. Okay. So we've, this is how to draw, how to make a function and how to use it. And we're going to use a lot of different functions in our game because we're going to have one function to draw a player and another function to draw um, things on the screen and another function to, you know, check to see if the player is moving and all this kind of stuff. So we're going to use a lot of functions uh, starting tomorrow. But I'm going to erase this. And because we're done for now with the with our function, I'm going to erase it. Um, also, I should mention, I'm going to be sending everybody a video with all the things that we've covered today in one video. I'll send that to you at the, um, later today. And uh, so you can, you can watch all this again later um, in a little bit of a faster format where you can pause and all that kind of stuff. So if, if you don't get all of it today in this class, that's okay. That's fine. Um, you'll get a video later that you can watch. Okay. So we can make our own variables and name them whatever we want. Like we can say uh, name equals quote Dylan. That's my name. You could put your name. Um, you don't have to put my name. Now, when we put an equal sign, that's not the same as what you're used to when um, uh, Alan, yes, we'll be making a new game that's different from what we made in the spring. Um, so this equal sign means something different than what you're used to with math. Like in math, if you say, um, you know, X equals, oops, equals five and five equals X. Well, this is, this works the same in math. It's saying just, okay, yeah, these are the same. And five is the same as X. That's not how it works in coding. In coding, um, Uh, Shanna, we might do the same game sometime, but I like to do different games because, you know, a lot of you uh, have come back to do this class and 
Uh, I want you to see something new each time. So the equal sign actually means something different in coding. In encoding, the equal sign says, take what's over here and put it in here. So if we have an equal sign here, we're saying take this stuff and put it over here. That makes more sense when you start dealing with numbers. So for example, let's say we have uh, size equals 10. Okay, great. So let's print size. So if we say print size, what it does is it says, okay, whatever is being stored in size, it takes 10 and stores it in size. Now, if we say print size, it says take whatever's in size and print it. So if we run this, you'll see it prints 10. Now, what if we do this? Size equals 10 plus three. And now we print it. Well, this is the first part about variables is that they can vary, meaning up here, it's equal to 10. But down here, we're saying, okay, take, do 10 plus three, then take the result and store it in size. So here it should print 10, and here it should print 13. Let's see, there it is. So it did, it printed 10 and then 13. We can also do things like size plus five. So now it will take whatever size is, and say plus five and we run it. Now we'll see it says it prints 18 because it already did the math of 13 and stored it in size. Then it said, okay, well, what's size plus five? Here's the important part though. What happens if we print size right after that? So here we printed size and it was 10 because size equals 10. Then we said size equals 13 so then we print size plus five. So this should be 13 plus five. Now, if we print size again, we're going to run it and you'll see it prints 13 again. It didn't print 18, but even though we said size plus five, this is still 13 because this is the only place we assigned what should be in size. We said, this is what should be in size. Here, we didn't say what should be in size. We just said, take whatever it is and add five to it. But it doesn't change what's inside size. That's done with the equal sign. So if we said down here, if we said size equals whatever size is plus five, now this is, an, this is saying, take whatever's in size right now, which is 13, add five, and then take the result and store it back into size. So we're changing what's in size. Now when we print size, it will print 18 again, just by printing size by itself. See how that works? This is a really important concept, and I hope a lot of you understand it. And um, uh, Oh, can everybody else hear me? Oh, that's not good. Um, hopefully, is anybody else having uh, quality issues? Like, is it getting stuttery or anything like that? Just want to make sure that it's not like cutting out for everybody. Hmm. Okay, Shanna, it, it might be just your connection. Um, so if there's any part of this that uh, you're missing, don't worry, you'll get a video after you could you can watch it again if you if you miss something. Um, okay, so this is a really important concept because we're going to do a lot with we're changing, uh, changing variables and changing what's inside them. And remember, they don't change until you use an equal sign. Even if you do something like this, it still stays the same. Okay, so one last thing. So I'm going to get rid of this stuff here. Remember we went over... Uh, things like when we said print and then five less than nine, it gave us like a true or false. Okay, so that allows us to do a lot of really cool things because we can do things like um, using true or false, we can do a lot of things. Like for example, we can say like, let's say lives equals five. So we have five lives. And then we can say, you know, if parenthesis lives is less than zero, 
then print, oh no. End. So right now, it, if we run it, nothing prints out. Why not? Because, um, hold on one sec. Let me just answer Shannon real quick. Um, okay, so, um, so here's how this works. So it's going to check to see if lives is less than zero. If that's true, then it will do this. But if it's not true, it's just going to skip it. So if we change this to like, let's say we set lives to minus one, well, that's less than zero. So let's run it. Now it prints, oh no, because this is now true. So if allows you to do something only if something else is true or not. And that's really useful for making decisions about our game. Like for example, um, if lives is zero, we want the game to be over, right? But we can do other things too. Like we can say, okay, if lives is zero, then print, oh no. But if it's not zero, then print, aha. So now we'll put lives back to five. So if, is lives less than zero? No, it's not because five is obviously not less than zero. So it won't do this, but else means, okay, well, if this wasn't true, then just do this. So now we can run it and it'll print, ha. Huh? And then if we set this to minus one, now it'll print, oh no, instead of ha ha. So this allows us to make decisions in our code. And you'll notice we always have this end here because we have to tell it when we're done making these decisions. Because if we put something else down here, like um, by, then what will print before this is based on whether lives is less than zero, but it will always print by because our, we're done with this if thing here using end. So if, this, okay, then print this, otherwise print this, and we're done making those decisions, just keep going normally. So if we run this, it will say, oh no, bye. And if we set lives to five, it'll say, ha ha, bye. But you notice it prints by both times because that's outside the if. Okay, so we're kind of getting toward the end of what we're gonna cover today. And I just wanna remind you um, some of the things that we covered. We talked about how you can have uh, variables, which are just names for information that we're storing. Okay. And we have variables that can hold numbers. We have variables that can hold true or false. Um, we have variables that can hold text and we can do a lot of different things with those. Um, we're going to cover tomorrow. We're going to cover actually turning all this, all these concepts into making a game. Um, don't forget, we also covered functions, which are just kind of like packages of instructions to the computer to tell it, this is how to do this set of instructions. Um, and um, if you have any questions on this, you can always feel free to email me. I'm going to put my email address on the screen here. Um, so this is my email address. You're always welcome to email me if you have any questions. I'm going to be sending you an email with a video of what we covered today. And uh, that will be coming from that email address. So feel free to email me back if you have any questions. Um, Shanna, uh, I, I saw what you, you noted. Unfortunately, I, I, uh, I'm sorry to hear that the internet was cutting out for you. Um, but like I said, uh, you will get a video at the end of class. Um, so we're going to wrap up now, but uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to send me an email. Um, feel free to play around in the sprite editor and the sound editor and the music editor and just uh, have some fun. Um, and we will take, we will start tomorrow um, and uh, we will start making a game and we'll make a game over the next couple days. And uh, at the end of each class, you'll get a video covering everything we covered in the class. So even if tomorrow, let's say 
um, you get a bit behind or something comes up and you have to leave in the middle of it or whatever, whatever the reason, you will still get a video at the end of the class that covers everything we cover each day. Um, so you can follow along and pause it and check to make sure that everything's working correctly. I just don't want anybody to feel like they're going to get left behind if they miss any part of it. Um, okay, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask now. That's great to hear, Alan. Alan was saying he's uh, doing the snake game from that we made in the spring. That was a fun game. I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed doing that game. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up now. Um, oh, that's awesome. That's good to hear, Alan. Alan added pizza sprites to his game. I like doing sprites in Pico 8. It's a lot of fun and it's a it's definitely a challenge to do it with with these few colors, but it's really surprising what you can actually fit into uh, just this tiny space. Um, it is quite a lot of fun. Um, and you're, you'd be really surprised what you can do with just these colors. I was, uh, I'm always amazed at what people end up making um, with these colors in this small amount of space. Okay, we're gonna wrap up now. Thank you everybody for joining. I will see you tomorrow. Um, and I will send you an email later today with a video of everything we covered so far. Okay, bye everybody.